morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us in a conversation with Donna Bergstrom. She's the deputy chair of the Republican Party of Minnesota. And what an honor and a privilege to speak with you this morning, Ms. Bergstrom. Thank you so much for your tireless efforts in Minnesota. How are things going in the race these days to take back Minnesota, ma'am? Mm. Well, good morning, Wes, and good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me on. Um, you know, so that's a very interesting question. How is everything going here in Minnesota? Uh, because I would say a couple of months ago, we saw how well our um, presidential race was going. It was Trump leading Biden by several uh, points, seven, eight, nine, ten, depending upon the polls. And then once the DFL in Minnesota, I'm sorry, the Democrats um, nationwide pulled their coup and put Kamala Harris in charge um, of that ticket. Then um, she pulled another uh, quickie and uh, had uh, Tim Waltz, our governor, um, selected as her vice presidential candidate. So what happened was those poll numbers went down dramatically and she lost uh, considerable ground where she typically would have had a bump after the DNC convention, after the announcement of Waltz, um, typically you would have seen a bounce in those numbers and what we saw was a decline. So what that tells me is that, you know, Minnesota, as I've always said, isn't as left-leaning as people like to think. Um, we're really common sense people. We just drive uh, a lot of folks um, to the polls in greater numbers uh, on the other side than we do on, on the Republican side. So we need to do a better job at that. But um, I think what we're seeing in Minnesota is that people are really fired up about so many things that happened under the Waltz administration that um, just now the national media is starting to pick up on that I think we're, we've got a really good chance of winning back the Minnesota House um, this cycle and even um, delivering our uh, electoral college votes for President Trump. So that he's still down a little bit compared to Harrison, um, depending upon the poll, but people are really starting to see the the uh, lack of policy that Harris has and um, just kind of the irony of saying on day one she's going to do x y and z when I think she's on day I don't know 1300 whatever the number is why aren't you doing it now <laughs> and then of course Waltz everything that happened while he was uh, uh, our governor twice um, so so we can talk about that but there is a lot of material there on him there certainly is, and it seems with the selection of uh, Walls as her running mate, it shines a bright, hot light, spotlight mm -hmm. on Minnesota and all of the corruption and the fraud and the waste and abuse that so many people have just been shocked about. And uh, But first to address, do, do you think the DFL or the Democrats nationally, did they notice this time that they didn't get a chance to choose their candidates again, again, again? Oh. I mean, did they? For the party that claims to be concerned about democracy, they are not out there actually engaging in democracy. They don't have a caucus process that produces candidates. It's astonishing. Did, how did, right. how would, what's happening with the, what's your sense of how the DFL feels about that? Well, you know, here in Minnesota, what we see is that they just get in lockstep with whoever gets crowned, they get in lockstep. Um, and that when you do have those dissenting voices, like Congressman Dean Phillips, who came out right out of the chute saying, I'm going to run for president because, you know, Biden's not going to cut the mustard. And um, then you have RFK coming out on the national level saying... <laughs> Look, I was trying to run, you know, legitimately and I was, you know, cut out of the process because it's controlled by by elites. And so I think everybody now is is able to see that, not just here in Minnesota. We're really recognizing what the Democratic Party is all about and and really it's probably very far at this point from what the old Democratic Party used to be. Um, yeah. if it if it even still exists, um, but also mm -hmm. just very far from that whole notion of of democracy. So I completely agree with that. Yeah, that's that's so true. Um, it's that going a little bit further back before going forward, uh, strange that they might not remember that Biden was a product of that process that uh, that cut out alternative candidates for the presidency as well. 
and Biden had pushed aside, for ex for example, Bernie Sanders and mm -hmm. stole the nomination. And Hillary was also kicked to the curb in that process of, in Iowa in their own straw polling and so forth. So, um, and, and Wes, let me just add, you know, in 2018, Governor Waltz was not the endorsed candidate coming out of the DFL convention. It was Aaron and Aaron. But he and uh, his running mate chose to run in the primary. Um, so again, you just have this notion of, you know, uh, I know better than you do, so I'm going to go ahead and run, um, even though the party was uh, endorsing somebody else. That's interesting you should say that because it, it happened to me as well in, in my experience working with Democrats when I used to be a DFLer. But mm. it's not uh, it's not my grandpa and grandma's DFL anymore. It's There's no. no farmers in it. There's no laborers in it. Doesn't look like there's any Democrats in it either. <laughs> no, they're really liberal progressives. And, you know, I live here in Duluth, Minnesota. And my state senator is endorsed by the Democrat Socialists of America. And my state representative is endorsed by the Democrat Socialists of America. So we have some, some things going on here in Minnesota that are, are alarming to me. Um, and certainly should be alarming to everyone now that we have, you know, this national spotlight on us, like you said. And then so moving forward to that point, it uh, looks like Tim Walls was a drag as much as uh, half on Harris's uh, somewhat of a lead that what she assumed to have. Mm -hmm. But uh, now that the United States Congress has subpoenaed uh, Mr. Walls, we're about to find out a lot more about the Feeding Our Future fraud. And some of us have been mm -hmm. talking about that since 2019. Mm -hmm. And um, just to to put in a little plug, I, I did videos in 2019 with people who had leakers inside the Feeding Our Future uh, mm -hmm. fraud. We were we were talking about that in a couple ways, but mostly it had to do with the unsanitary conditions that the food was being prepared under, and mm -hmm. then people weren't properly uh, were handling food properly allegedly. But going forward, what kind of um, what can we expect to see Mr. Walls questioned about when he gets to the United States Congress under subpoena and he's forced to answer questions about fraud, waste and abuse in our state that's so rampant? Oh, it's just astonishing. Just astonishing. Um, you know, this is so far reaching. It's 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 unbelievable. I don't even have words for it. Um, in fact, I, I had uh, even pulled off of the Internet the IRS. The IRS, if you go to their website, they have federal charges announced against 10 additional defendants in Feeding Our Future fraud scheme. Um, and they call it the largest COVID-19 fraud scheme in the nation. How the about nation. that? We can't be number one in our graduation rates out of high school or number one in our math scores. No, we have to be number one under Governor Waltz for the largest COVID-19 fraud scheme. How embarrassing. Um, but this is just truly astonishing. 47 were charged in this. And I think this is really just what we're seeing is just the tip of the iceberg. What we have found out about how much else was happening, you know, we don't know. And of course, then there was that situation where an individual was flown into Minnesota with a whole bundle of cash, tried to pay off a juror, you know, so it just keeps getting deeper and deeper. But I, I'm really hopeful that um, that the Feeding Our Future scandal is going to produce some results. And it's unfortunate that it had to go all the way up to the U.S. House. I mean, if Governor Waltz was really a leader, he would hold somebody accountable. He would have right. oversight. Maybe he would appoint a special commission. I don't know what, what all his tools are. But he would at least show some interest in, um, and, I, and I don't even know what the numbers we're at right now, $458 million total with, with all the frauds, um, because it's not just feeding our future. You've got um, the the frontline workers, you've got the autism centers, you've, you know, you've got the Medicare, it, it's just bundles of cash that are flying out of our, our coffers um, in these fraudulent schemes. So I'm kind of going off on a tangent here. I know we want to stay no. on feeding our future, but yeah, I think it's, it's going to be astonishing. And maybe the feeding our future fraud is just one of, example of how the Democrats say we want everything fully funded, fully funded, fully funded. They, they recite that it must be fully funded, but we're fully funding these fraudsters. Yeah. And that's 
one emblematic, uh, the Feeding Our Future thing is is just one of many, like uh, the new one coming out is uh, Medicare and Medicaid overbilling and defrauding seniors on Medicare and Medicaid. That's so important. And uh, of course, there was the daycare scandal over a period of decades before this yeah. came to light. People were active at that, uh, at the DHS with yeah. um, that issue. But uh, I'm one that really bothers me now is the senior nutrition program being ripped off. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it, the, it seems to target these vulnerable groups, these mm -hmm. vulnerable groups who really need this support that we as good hearted Minnesotans have said, yes, we believe in this program. And then it gets frauded. And what does the governor do? He turns his back and does nothing for us. He doesn't investigate. He doesn't hold anybody accountable. You know, that's just not leadership. And, and, and the governor, along with the Democrats, stonewalled any investigations into this. For example, uh, the, the Democrats voted against directing the attorney general's office to investigate fraud, mm -hmm. waste and abuse in government. And that was on uh, February 6th of 2023. It's not ancient history. They just don't want to they don't want to have the attorney general's office investigate the fraud, waste and abuse. And they voted against requiring a financial oversight report conducted by a third party of the Department of Human Services to identify fraud at the department and that was in that was in may of 2024 so that's just a few months ago but there's two solid examples where the democrats voted to resist any kind of like turning over the rocks to see what the lizards are or creatures underneath them are but right. um yeah yeah in lockstep you know and, and again what what party is um ellison you know, DFL slash DSA. So why would he want to investigate any of this? And it just, um, you know, shows that the corruption is so deep. What else is going to be found out um, while, when we start looking into this? And it brings us back to the Office of the Legislative Auditor, who has the responsibility to oversee and, and, and audit some of these programs. And they said in their report, or the, the, um, the, the lady in charge said, well, you know, this is alarming. We're we're seeing lots of this. There's a pattern of this. And basically the administration says, well, you know, too bad. There was no remorse. There was no, gee, we're sorry. We'll put some controls in place. So again, I think everybody should really be astonished because if this is how he's going to be a governor of Minnesota, um, are we going to say that, see the same pattern, you know, as vice president, um, you know, at that level. So, uh, so hang on to your pocketbooks, everybody. That's all I can say. <laughs> guard, <laughs> they, guard that wall. <laughs> yep. They, they need to fully fund some fraud. So what is it going to be next? Uh, are you following the public's concern about tax increases? Cause that's a really big thing too. And of course here in Rochester, in addition to the sales tax being extended for 24 years and increased, we have a special sales tax in addition to the Minnesota state sales tax. Even the chamber of commerce was for it. Incredibly hmm. DFL controlled. Yeah. It's unusual. Cause now people are shopping in other towns, but, um, uh, <laughs> They want to increase property taxes uh, in the in the city of Rochester in 25B. Are you are you seeing uh, anything coming from the other side where people are upset about the taxes in Minnesota? Is could that be a winning issue for the GOP? Absolutely, absolutely, 100%. You just nailed it right on the head. Um, there was a recent poll that just came out. Um, of, of what are what's on what's your top talk topic here in Minnesota? And the number one issue really was economy. And um, that ties into you know people's pocketbook. Going back to that, so it it even bumped up some of the other issues that we hear about all the time. And um, people are really concerned. And in Minnesota, had a surplus. I, I forget the number. It's sometimes seventeen point five billion. Some say eighteen. Some say nineteen. Um, yeah. But but there was billions of dollars that were surplus. And what's a surplus? That's money that we overpaid to the government, and that should have come back to us again. Walt showed his colors by campaigning on, I'm going to give all Minnesotan taxpayers $2,000 back. I didn't get $2,000, okay? No. 
you know, so so we just go back to that whole thing. So there was this budget that could have been really used to alleviate some of the pain and suffering that we're feeling um, with the economy. Our inflation is is just, uh, you know, up, 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 up. Um, but instead, they just blew it on other programs and then they increase the taxes. So I think if we tell people, here's what's really happening this this is a, a selling issue for us. And, you know, Republicans are typically more conservative with our, our fiscal budgets. And um, and I think that's a selling point for us. We're going to guard your money better than the other side. Um, and it was even in many of the sessions I watched them, it's typical for a bill to come with um, an, a summary of how much is, this is going to cost the government. The Democrats and their DFL would um, typically just push the bill through without that summary uh, amount being known. So how much is it going to cost? Oh, we don't know, but let's just pass it and we'll find out. One of those kind of uh, mindsets. So, yeah, I think that's a winning issue for us here is that um, people's money is just going out the door way too fast and taxes and special taxes and fees. That's really important because that, that's a way to to curb a process, to curb something. So if you want to eliminate, um, you know, private land ownership or private home ownership, just tax the heck out of people and you can't yeah. afford it anymore. Mm -hmm. Just it, yeah, right. Make affordable housing by taxing people on their on their property taxes, so their housing becomes less affordable. And I know young people dealing with that too. They're paying eight or nine hundred dollars for a four hundred square foot studio apartment yeah. mm -hmm. in in Rochester. And uh, one of the one of my coworkers, she's about 24, I suppose, or 23. Mm -hmm. She says she has to step over drunks passed out or druggies passed out in the foyer when she comes mm -hmm. into the building. And she, you know, she's like, what am I paying for? <laughs> she doesn't have much safety and security. That was going to be my next topic. But last thing mm -hmm. I'm to say about spending is mm -hmm. well, Donna, you know, they don't give us the total breakdowns and the numbers. They just want everything to go into that omnibus bill that's about a foot tall and just yeah. pass it, you know, at two o'clock in the morning. And, you know, a billion here and a billion there. And, you know, mm -hmm. all of a sudden you're talking about a lot of money, right? Right. Yeah. What's a billion amongst friends, right? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> right. I can't afford their compassion. I really can't afford it. They're, yeah. I, I mean, it, because I'm a, I'm a compassionate person, but mm -hmm. I'd like to choose who's going to be the recipient of mm -hmm. my largesse. And I'm not the richest guy in the world, but I've yeah. given, I've given food to people in Rochester on the street. Like after I get done shopping at Costco mm -hmm. and I'll have an extra loaf of bread or something. And I pass mm -hmm. that to the person and they throw it on the ground. That's not what they want. So oh. I, you know, I, I keep giving, I keep giving, but you know, they want the cash money. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I went off the rails a little bit there, but, um, with the next, I'm wondering if you, we could talk a little bit about, uh, public safety. That seems to be an issue with people around Rochester in this area, public safety. We see what's happening in the twin cities. We see what's happening where people drive out from the twin cities and they go down to rural areas and they cause some issues off the beaten track, you know, in a County they're not familiar with, but they they kind of, you know, in Rochester, home invasion is a little bit less of a thing than it was a year ago, but because it's being apparently reclassified as robbery or it's being like mm -hmm. put into something else. So, or, um, but the crime statistics in Minnesota are, are pretty appalling. Is there anything you have to say about a uh, public safety issue? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, again, it, it starts at the top. And, um, you know, one of the, the other, the COVID-19 crisis, of course, happened under Tim Waltz, but then also the George Floyd riots. And what did we see just shortly after, you know, he, he took his second term was that he allowed the entire city of Minneapolis, that those, those blocked areas to just burn down. It was burning and looting and people were being applauded um, from the Democratic side. His wife said, I want to pull down the window so I can get that smell of the burning rubber. I mean, just all this craziness and nonsense. His daughter, Hope, was texting people, you know, the National Guard or, or the, the state troopers yeah. are coming to this area. I mean, all these things that are, um, you know, not good public policy. These aren't these aren't things that that tell people, you know, we support 
our public um, safety. And so it starts at the top. He's made it very well known. He's not interested in protecting you and me and, and our private property. Um, he's not interested in protecting our, our streets and our businesses. He's just going to let them burn down. Um, he calls our National Guard members 19-year-old um, cooks. I mean, there's just so little respect that this man has for what has been our traditional way of life, which is law and order. And if you don't have law and order, what do you have? You have chaos. So we saw three, you know, three days for sure of chaos in Minneapolis um, under under Tim Waltz. And um, now we're just seeing chaos play out throughout because the message is um, don't fear the criminal. Um, you know, we want we want uh, people to just do mm -hmm. whatever do so law and order is really a high priority and i would say uh, most minnesotans agree with that we we can't ride our trains in the metro area because there's so much uh crime that's and uh and we can't go on our roads safely at any moment there's going to be a uh I don't know, some type of protest. And the next thing you know, you're stuck in a, in a big protest. I go down into Minneapolis occasionally. I'll text my husband going in. And then when I come out, hey, I came out, didn't get carjacked or, or robbed. You know, uh, yeah, who does that? I mean, I went to school at the University of Minnesota Twin Cities back in the 80s, uh, mid 80s. Uh, but, um, you know, I, can, I don't even feel like I can go down there anymore. And when you go down there, there's no businesses. There's, you know, it, most of the people have left out of there. So it's, it's just this whole thing is just really sad. And and I just really my heart just breaks for Minnesota because we used to really be the gem of of the Midwest. We had good schools. We had good parks and you know rec. We had good shopping. Um, you know, they're they're just it just seems really sad that it's just been so destroyed under Governor Tim Waltz. Yeah, definitely. And you know, we had our chapter of the protests, three days, four days of protests, and they locked down the streets. And it was interesting how they canceled COVID. They had locked us down yeah. since the one week before Easter that year. And then they canceled COVID for three days <laughs> to come out and set everything on fire. And mm -hmm. uh, they were shutting down the streets. And then um, after all these characters showed up in Rochester, we had Black Panther party members and we had um, Los Los Brown Berets, which is a kind of Mexicali, Mexicali Latino supremacy group from, it's a different kind of national, it's sort of a California thing, I thought, but the, we had other groups coalescing in Rochester and, and then of course there were these public protests and marching in the street and um, uh, then they placed us under a curfew. Uh, so we had a paramilitary, quasi-paramilitary curfew. We were all ordered to return to our homes. <laughs> and it's like, I had to go home from work and I had to drive through this uh, like zone. And of course, in those days, they had us carrying a letter in our car that said we were essential workers and we could pass. And oh I just... My gosh. I have I have lived in some crazy places, but uh, mm -hmm. you know this this was really strange to see Rochester. Uh, you know, all of our politicians were were politicking off it at that point. The uh, for for my part, I know that the DFL was involved with that through uh, Alita Baroud, and that goes to the highest levels of the DFL committee, mm -hmm. um, campaigning and promoting it. But um, I, I see here with interest that the, D the DFL voted against directing the attorney general's office to investigate organized gang crime, drug crime, and retail theft. And that occurred uh, in February of 2023. Um, so... There's just seems to be like no interest in keeping this basic law and order. And then, of course, you don't have a right to defend yourself as they're going after the castle doctrine. Mm -hmm. You can't even defend yourself in your own home. So yeah. it seems like a losing issue for them. Is there is there anything you'd want to say about uh, uh, migration or illegal immigration to Minnesota as late is is the GOP uh, talking about illegal immigration? to, to uh, Minnesota at this point, or should we talk about that at another time? Well, it certainly is a topic. I mean, right now we are a border state. You know, Minnesota is a border state. You know, we've, we're we we're right in the mix with Texas. So when we talk about our border invasion, we are a border state. 
And so there are um, illegal immigrants that are coming across the Canadian border into Minnesota. And most recently, and I don't have it pulled up here on my computer, but there was a situation where some folks got into some trouble and they had to call out um, the the. Uh, police to come and help fish them out. I think they got into a pond or, or some type of water. And um, they said in the in the announcement, and please bring people that speak Spanish. Okay, so so what is it? You know, we need some help here on the northern yeah. as well. And um, you're right, during COVID, you couldn't get across the border. We couldn't get across the border, but others could get across the border, and it was it's it's quite fluid. So um, I would say it's a big issue. I would say Minnesota start, you know, chiming up here because we are a border state, and I know everybody goes down to uh, Texas and and looks at that, but come up here and see what we've got. And uh, quite frankly, you know, Kamala Harris was the border czar. And, uh, you know, I don't know that she ever went up to, to northern Minnesota once to kind of check on our, our borders. But, but at any rate, no, I think it is a big issue. What we're seeing is people are really concerned. So this brings up kind of a segue into our voting, okay? And we know yes. early, early voting starts September 20th, but we have yeah. already seen um, that that this uh, driver's license for all, and we're not going to ask you, you know, if you're a legal immigrant, an illegal immigrant, according to the DFL. Um, so everybody gets a driver's license, and then this stuff gets bundled up, and it gets sent over to the Secretary of State, and all those people then get automatic ballots, unless they check a teeny tiny little box, I think is what it goes of, of opting out, okay? So I'm not an expert right in that area, but but at any rate, we're, we're already seeing that ballots are being sent to individuals who should not be given a ballot. And the Republican uh, Party of Minnesota, along with the, um, the Republican National Committee, we sent out a letter saying, hey, what's going on here, Secretary of State? And he said, oh, it's not my fault. It's the Department of you know, Safety, the, the people that issue the license. And they're supposed to do the check-in, and then they send us back the, the clean rolls. Well, you know, every time you turn around, there's always finger pointing. There's nobody that really wants to take responsibility for this. So I'm a little bit on a tangent here because free and fair voting is near and dear to my heart. And I think everybody deserves to have their vote count. And if we're going to dilute it with, with illegals who are not um, allowed to vote in our elections, I think everybody should be angry about that. I don't care what stripe you're wearing, Republican, Democrat, immigrant, independent, that affects everybody. So we should all be concerned. And that's not tangential at all. That's central to uh, what I had intended to ask you about next. So you really, you really went like you went beyond what I thought you were going to say or what you what I thought you might be prepared to say. But no, I'm right there with you in terms of this driver's licenses for all. I remember when we tried warning people when we had the Election Integrity Committee of Olmstead County and we're working with, you know, Rick right. Weeble, all these other groups, and uh, Andrew Selick and so forth. Mm -hmm. But uh, driver's licenses for all was the foot in the door. And we said mm -hmm. that's going to segue into voting for all. And here we are. And the, the, are. the voter training, I'm, I'm hearing from people who are sitting in the training, whether it's city canvassing or for the county, they're being told not to uh, question anybody who comes in to vote. So nobody can be asked, you know, any, anything. You just, you give them a ballot. Mm -hmm. You're yeah. not supposed to. I've, I've been at the polling station with my ID saying, is anybody going to ask to see my driver's license or my ID? <laughs> No, not interested. The DFL people say, we know who you are. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> they bring some really scary people from I don't know where to work in the polling stations, but there's some they have some strange guys that they bring in when it's time to vote. So although yeah. it might not be such a glamorous issue, but uh health care is really on everybody's minds. It's not, it's some kind of issue that you know people aren't getting the value, perhaps the health care dollars again touches on fraud, waste, and abuse. That also happens within, you know, transportation services, getting the elders to their appointments. So there's, um, everybody's kind of skimming off, whether it's transportation or health care. Is there anything the GOP can do better to assure people that we're not trying to come after their health care? Because that's something the Democrats always say, they're so kind hearted, and we're the ones that don't want to fund anything, and they want it to be fully funded. But um, yeah. How do we grab that football back? 
from the DFL of healthcare. Right. Yeah. And that, that is just such a big issue. Um, you know, and again, once again, Minnesota was a leader with um, MNsure and MNCare, and we had programs that were very successful that even other states modeled. And, you know, all of a sudden, now we have Governor Waltz who's saying, you know, uh, we need to have health care for all, socialized medicine. And what's really being missed out of this whole equation is the fact that we're not graduating enough doctors and nurses to take care of um, of all of our folks here in um, in Minnesota, let alone the whole nation. So, so healthcare, yes, you can offer healthcare for everybody, but you're going to wait six months to get your appointment if you um, if you don't have people in the pipeline that are going to help take care of us. So. Um, I think what we need to really start focusing on is is what is the what is the balance that we need? How how can we help people get the health care that they need? But then also how can we bolster up this health um, system so that it's it's able to help people and it has enough support within the system so that it, it can take care of people. And preventative medicine is really an important aspect of this equation too. So um, so is there something that we can do with our preventative? And so many people put a lot of emphasis on this Western medicine model. And um, you know, we talked a little bit earlier about, you know, I am native. And so with with my cultural background, you know, I'm not I'm not so, you know, into the Western uh, medicine model. And so I think if you do a, you know, one one medicine fits all everybody type model, that's gonna leave me out of the equation. And I, I think it's better better for us to have a multitude of options for us to be able to choose from. So I can choose the program that works best for me. So I always like that competition to me is better than just having, you know, one size fits all and everybody's going to be under this one model. And, uh, you know, maybe I want to, maybe I just want to do acupuncture and, you know, health, healthy, uh, you know, diet and, and, you know, not go to those other meds. Well, how can I get that? I can't if I'm under your Western medicine model. Um, so what's a program that's going to fit for me? I think this is a whole conversation that that people aren't willing to have because you're right it does make us sound like oh we're not we're not for you know everybody having the same you know medicine approach um we can't you know we're the bad guys no that's not what it is is all at all we we want to believe you we you know if you know what's best for you we want you to be able to uh, be able to choose that program so that's a hard message to sell because it's really easy for the democrats to just say well the republicans are against you know everybody having health care. That, that's an easy message to sell. Ours, we want everybody to be able to choose and it's nuanced and this and that. I mean, you got you got three seconds with somebody and, uh, and, and, and it's tough, but health care is certainly an issue I think somebody needs to start looking into because it's it's on the precipice. It's going over the cliff here pretty fast. It really is. I, I was astonished during COVID when Governor Walls waived some of the requirements for nurses in Minnesota mm -hmm. because we have such high professional standards and then so many people are leaving the profession. So to make it easier to license and hire nurses, he he just waves it off. Well, I'm not a person who wants to see uh, Minnesota committing a brain drain on the rest of the world, and that could be the Philippines or that could be Nigeria. We don't have to take away, I mean, it, it takes those societies a lot of effort and energy to produce nurses, to produce doctors, to produce engineers and in their societies. And for, you know, the State Department to just issue uh, visas to take away the cream of their crop, so to speak. I mean, does Nigeria not need nurses? Of course they do. Of course right. they do. Does the Philippines, the Philippines definitely needs nurses. So yeah. to take all those people away who've mm -hmm. managed to get to attain those levels of certification, it, yeah. it doesn't seem, uh, anyway, the U.S. government used to prevent that sort of thing. They called it a brain drain and they never wanted to do that to other mm -hmm. societies. But now we're, well, we'll just scoop everybody up and uh, bring them here. So, right. I mean, are we thinking about uh, climate and energy policy at all? That's sort of something that they hit us on, like we're not green and, you know, <laughs> well, 
<laughs> you know, you see all these windmill turbines that are killing bald eagles and the mm -hmm. bird populations are being decimated. And right. those those spinning wheels, just they take out all the falcons and the eagles and even smaller bird species. And yeah. there's people that have to go around and pick the carcasses up off the ground. It's just not, it's not okay. Right. I, that's what, And then to to convert arable farmland, good black dirt, to convert that into just fields and fields of uh, solar energy panels, to my way of thinking, seems to be a waste of good arable land. Why not put those solar panels on buildings or parking lots or over a Costco parking lot or over a, a Walmart parking lot somewhere and let it serve a, du serve a dual purpose of... Mm -hmm. I think they did that at the MSP airport. Aren't didn't they put solar panels at the on the top of the parking? Well, anyway, um, so anything about climate and energy that you might want to touch on as an issue or yeah. Uh, sure. Yeah. yeah, well, sort of tongue in cheek. I love global warming because I wouldn't be able to live here in Duluth, Minnesota if we wouldn't have the ice caps melt and the <laughs> glaciers melt. Um, <laughs> you know, because and, this used to and be they're all by <laughs> <laughs> they buy properties right on the Atlantic Ocean. The billionaire <laughs> Democrats keep buying properties on Martha's Vineyard and so forth in Montauk, right. where, where my my native folks hail from that area, the, okay. the Abenaki clan of the, you know, kind of language family from okay. out of Canada, but it's it's around Connecticut and sure. Vermont, New York and stuff, but Algonquin. Yeah. Algonquin. But, okay. Yeah. But but I wouldn't. I still don't want to live like that. I mean, I uh, nature is that we're in this constant struggle with nature, and you want to stay warm in the winter time. Right. Right. Exactly. Well, I think the climate change narrative really. Um, so let me just go back. So I was I was reminded just the other day that it was under President Nixon that the Environmental Protection Agency was formed. OK, so Republicans used to be the environmental champions. And then somewhere along the lines, the Democrats sort of co-opted that and now have made it this green, you know, green energy and climate change thing. OK, the climate's going to change. What I think we need to be really focused on, again, is this balance. We all need energy to live. We are, we are in a society now in a way of life that requires a good amount of energy. I think all options should be on the table. And of course, you know, once again, here I am in Northeast Minnesota, where we have just this beautiful iron range full of resources that are given to us as for us to use. And so we know how to mine them. We know how to keep our environment safe and clean. And yet you're going to have this Harris uh, administration, should she get in, along with Walt, saying, you know, we're anti-mining. We're not going to, you know, move into that pristine area. But how many tons of copper does it need to to make one of those windmills? I think it's somewhere like 30 tons or something. It's a huge amount of copper. Where do you get yeah. copper from? You get copper from the ground. How do you get it out of the ground? You mine it. So, you know, you have to be logical about this. And, you know, I talked a little bit earlier, I had just taken a trip across um, the U.S. a little bit. And when you get down to Oklahoma, um, Arizona, um, in, in those areas, New Mexico, there's tons of windmills, just tons of them. Um, it's astonishing. And um, so that's okay. So that's happening. But then what's happening with our grids? Do we have enough grid space to even store this energy if we were able to get to the point where we can really suck up all that sun energy. And I love the fact that people say um, solar is renewable. That's not a renewable energy source. The sun is a dying <laughs> bulb, okay? So yeah. it's 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 not renewable, but um, whatever. So you can suck in that energy and put it all, at, well, our grids are at capacity. So, so we on that solar point, the thing that I think is the worst aspect of the solar the thing is the lithium batteries. So that's the aspect mm -hmm. of it not being green because these the third world countries, and that's a term we can't use anymore, the developing nations, the countries we exploit for mining lithium mm -hmm. in Central America, South America, Africa, these, these lithium mines are a complete disaster to the local environment. Right. Birds can't fly. If the fumes, if birds breathe the fumes from these ponds, they drop dead into the pond. It's, wow. a, it's a complete wasteland. It, yeah. They are green. It's green water that mm. fills up into these areas, but um, there's nothing green about 
these yeah. lithium batteries were producing. And then we dump them into the ground and that goes into our groundwater and our soil. Right. So, um, sorry, so I, I love I, I, sorry. No, no, no. I think this is great conversation. And what, what I just wanted to say is I love how our, our green energy people fly in on their private jets, have their <laughs> meetings, and then fly back out on their private jet. And, you know, we're, what's fueling that private jet, okay? Um, but just really to talk about going to these places, going and seeing what, what a mining operation looks like in these different countries. I think people would have a very different perspective of, of what it what it really means to have all of this energy. Um, but we certainly can't, what, what was the equation that I heard when we came, you know, when, when Ford developed the, the car, uh, we didn't go out and, you know, put all the horses out to pasture. They worked in tandem with each other. So let's let's work in tandem with what we have to along with what we're going towards. Let's have those two work and then maybe one will get phased out eventually, but but you don't just cut it off right here because you still need stuff to get yourself um, to that other level. That's that's really true. Um, we have touched on a lot of issues. Um, yeah, the trifecta. Uh, Mm -hmm. We could talk again about uh, universal basic income or the paint licenses that you have to have or, oh, here's a hot button issue. Uh, what do we think about house file 4393, like the sports teams and the showers and the bathrooms and the hotel rooms on school trips and, um, yeah. you know, all these accommodations for people. Uh, there's a, it's already happening where people are making TikTok videos. Boys are mm -hmm. going into girls' bathrooms and making TikTok. Hey, I'm here. What are you doing yeah. in the girls' room? This is the girls' room. Well, I'm, I identify as a woman. Got yeah. you know, and it's like they say these things. Um, what's going to happen with our society? Is there anything you want to say about that, or should we leave that for another day, perhaps? <laughs> Well, that, that is a hot topic issue. And I, I just want to say, you know, America has had a precedence for decades, for, you know, centuries now of, um, of parents being in charge of their kids, not the government and not the schools. Parents were the ones that had the primary responsibility of educating their kids. So if I have a child that I want to have only housed with um, same sex individuals, I as the parent should have the right to do that. But the schools are telling the parents, you don't have any right over your children. Once they come into this realm, um, you've, you've surrendered your rights to us. Well, if that's the way it's going to be, I'm going to say parents take notice, get your kids out of those schools as fast as you can, homeschool, find a different source, uh, you know, whatever you can do, because that's not what's going to save America. Um, our, our next generation, our children are what's going to save us. And we need to educate them in the good grounding of our democracy, which, which our founding fathers so wisely crafted and created for us. And uh, every time I go back to that constitution and look at it, I think, wow, these guys were so smart. They figured everything out. It's all the tools are right there for us. Our freedom of speech, our freedom of religion, but, you know, right to defend ourselves and then mechanisms when the government gets too big. And I know, Wes, we really seem to be um, off here going, you know, both barrels blazing and I'd love to talk uh, more. And uh, yeah. there's just so much here. Well, one yeah. thing we did. Yes, yes, yes. Go ahead. No, no, I, I, I was just agreeing with you. But one <laughs> thing we... You, Continue, sorry. One thing we didn't get to was, of course, the stolen valor of Tim Waltz. And as a veteran, oh. you know, offended those of us in the community are about about his, uh, you know, years of saying that he's a command sergeant major and and all that he did um, and, and really now is coming under suspect of how cozy he was with communist China while he was in the National Guard. He went, you know, brags about going over there 30, 33 times, something like that. Well, you know, I was an intelligence officer and every time you had either foreign contact or went overseas, it either had to be approved or you had to do some type of a debrief when you got back. Are there reports of him doing that? So did he uphold his responsibilities even in the National Guard? So again, you know, I think that's just a whole nother topic and it shows yeah. this 
pattern, this pattern of uh, how destructive he is and will be for America if if he's continued to, um, like I continue to say, fail up. You know, I know people, you know, when you fail, you typically fail down. He just keeps getting promoted. He's failing up a lot as he goes here. But but another topic. Yeah, fail is where you fall upstairs over and over again, as <laughs> evidenced by Biden. And you're right. <laughs> And let's hope that Tim Walls has placed a lightning rod over Minnesota. So he's drawing, he's definitely drawing a, attention in the stolen valor aspect and all of his trips to China going way back to when he was a student. Uh, the trips to China are really cause for concern. Also, the the greeting that he does, he does the uh, kind of a, the, the historic tr tradition. But, you know, this is this is something that I'll do in terms of thanks to people as well. So it's it's a gesture, but it comes naturally. Um, so, um, not to criticize the gesture, but you know what, we have touched on a lot of issues and we have had a great session and I hope that we can do it again soon. And, uh, let's, let's remember, uh, again, Donna, Donna Bergstrom is a veteran, so she appreciates this aspect of stolen valor. Uh, and, and, uh, that's something we need to thank you for your service and, uh, Boy, it's been a long time coming, but it looks like Tim Walls is about to get some medicine handed to him. So, excellent. Donna Bergstrom, she's the deputy chair of the Republican Party of Minnesota, and thank you. And I'll I'll let you have the final goodbye here. So. All right. Well, thank you, Wes, and thank you to everybody who's listening. Remember, September 20th, early voting starts. Everybody that's going to cast a ballot um, on the conservative way, we certainly encourage you to get out there and vote um, and uh, bring a friend who's like-minded with you. Uh, thank you again. There's so much here to un unravel with this administration that I really hope people will do their, their due diligence, look into all the issues. And of course, if you have any questions, um, feel free to, to check out the Minnesota GOP website mngop.com. There's lots of good information on there for you to, to, to research. So thank you again, Wes, for having me. This was a real pleasure. Thank you, Donna. We'll talk to you again soon. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.